Hello, everyone. So welcome to the uh, AA Summer D-Lab Lecture Series for yet another uh, lecture. Today, we are happy to have with us Suryansh Sandra. Suryansh is a co-founder of Automata, which is a young robotic uh, company that started two and a half years ago and is already growing up to it now has uh, it's 12 personnel strong. And um, Automata is uh, sort of founded together with Mustafa El Sayed out of a personal frustration about how robots are being used for architectural research. So it provides an affordable uh, and easy access for people who want to use robotics and uh, while combining elegance in the actual code together with, uh, let's say, self-replicating hardware. I think we will see a lot about that today. So I'm not going to go into the details myself. Uh, a few words about Suryans. I was uh, happy to meet Suryans at the, at the office of Zahadid Architects, where he was uh, involved with the design research, uh, with the code group, which was tackling all sorts of issues about computation behind the elegant forms that the office uh, is, is well known for. And Suryans is also uh, giving lectures across different institutions and around the world. So with no further ado, I will invite uh, Suryans to talk a little bit more about what Automata is all about. Welcome, Suryans. Thanks, Alex, for the intro. I really wish somebody else introduced me like that. Self-replicating robots. I will try to meet your expectations, but no guarantees. And I'm already, I made a good start because I'm off by 11 months in my date. It's September 2016. Uh, anyway, thanks for inviting me, guys. It's nice to be here again. Um, and nice to be talking about what we do. That was a very good guess that we had 12 people now. <laughs> you didn't ask me. I'm really surprised how you know. But essentially, this is a little bit, uh, this lecture is not particularly geared about any one kind of thing. Uh, it's just an evolution of, I no longer work as an architect. I trained as an architect. I paid a lot of money to be studying as an architect here <laughs> and then graduated. But before I came here, I used to do architecture like this in India. And now I do stuff like this in, so 12 years later, this is again last year. Now things look a little bit more evolved than this. And it's a little bit of how, at least for me, the personal journey of going from really conventional, old school, ar colonial architecture like this to uh, doing a lot of stuff in between to get here happened. And I can kind of walk you guys through a few of the, the most interesting steps on the way. I, I, I don't particularly per se want to dwell on a dragonfly or any particular project in general. But basically, when when I graduated in 2004 as an architect, these were the kind of heroes in architecture that I knew of. And I was fortunate enough to get to work for one of them. I came here in 2007 uh, at the AA to study. I graduated in 2009. And this, this is kind of a, suddenly the architecture that I used to design started looking like this, which was scary because I no longer had any sense of physics or gravity or materials, but everything was shiny and glossy and fancy. And then I went to work for her. Everyone knows who that is. Uh, I worked there for six years. Um, and that's kind of where things like this started. In fact, this was all already at the AA where uh, I guess you guys are familiar with Grasshopper and Maya and stuff like that. But back, back in 2006, there was no Grasshopper. There was no, uh, well, there was Rhino. But this was the best shot you had at doing anything automated. This was called Monkey. It was called Monkey Script Editor. You can see it. It's called Code Monkey. And to do, to basically just do anything as simple as draw a point on its own would take you like at least five lines of code and five days the first time you were doing it. And this is about 2008. So I was kind of halfway through the AA, DRL, when this came along. And this was magical when it came out. This is the first version of Grasshopper. It wasn't even called Grasshopper. It was called Explicit History, as you can see. This is 2008. And this was all the tools you had in it to, to do stuff. And suddenly, doing something like this, which, was, which is something that required the best coders of the class at the time, became one icon in Grasshopper, which was to find the closest point on the curve. 
this was insane. This used to be insanely complicated, and after Grasshopper came, this was just one button, which was amazing because that showed me how to do research, or at least kind of killed the fear of writing code for me because I I couldn't write code. Uh, I went on to work for the research team. That's a whole different story. How I how that landed, I will walk you uh, like I can show you, but essentially we had a lot of problems in terms of like as an architect you're always like trying to solve problems or trying to uh, trying to have a go at things that you can solve and when you when you learn these tools brand new you're like oh yeah i'm going to go go s try to fix this problem or that problem because i can suddenly code or i can suddenly do things that are that are that are suddenly semi automated so this was kind of one of the first projects i worked in at zaha so this is kind of a block model or i don't know a volumetric model uh, this was a competition in Poland, and that's kind of like a huge public square. And we were designing this. You can guess which one is the Zaha building here. Uh, there, there were two big red blobs that are inside that. Those are basically concert halls. And we were designing a skin for it. And what we wanted to do was something like this. Uh, I know it looks like an animal or a skull or, or whatever, but in Zaha, it, it, it works. Uh, so there was a there was a lot of uh, this is kind of what was the desired outcome of what we wanted where we had a volumetric model we we wanted control over how the entrances work how the structural lines work how the openings work how the roof lights work and all of that had to work out, come out of this one singular pattern that would envelop this whole form which is for somebody who just graduated out of the out of the AA it was way above I was punching way above my weight. Like this was clearly not something I could I could sleep over for a while. So Grasshopper or tools and techniques at the time were made it really easy to do stuff like this, where um, you could you could do a simple map, like a 2D map, on which you could draw and you could map that to 3D. So whatever you draw, draw in 2D, some magic would happen that it would automatically get translated to 3D. So I figured that out quite quickly. And I was like, okay, so if I can break the problem down to two dimensions, it's much easier to figure out how to make cells on a 2D area rather than on this complex 3D surface. So then I started doing my first dabbles in code, which were basically circles fighting with each other to make cells, essentially. So this is basically circles pushing each other until they all kind of find their own space. So this is essentially a, an algorithm which simulates kind of like a fight for space. And so I, I let these algorithms run, and I, and, and I got better and better at it. Like you can see, there's a boundary, and nobody respects that boundary. They fight, they push, they, they expand as much as they want. But ultimately, I was like, hey, you, you guys should listen to the boundary. And then the boundary was like, started having its own rules. So I said, OK, anybody who leaves the boundary is dead. And the circle started being deleted. But then again, the distribution was not nice. I, was, I still wanted much better control. So remember that this is going to be mapped onto the facade of a building. And I want to control exactly how big each opening is, but still not draw each circle manually. So then I started getting better controls. I started embedding a JPEG underneath with, with color gradient so I could have a more finer tuned control on where I want the big cells and where I want the smaller cells. And again, the distribution is not pretty. So you can see, like, essentially, there was this one problem, one competition, which, which I had two days to do, that facade. And this thing happened for two months. This thing kept going for two months after the competition was already submitted. So what I did for the competition was manual. But in the end, I ended up spending the next two months in Zaha, spending time trying to figure out if I ever again have this problem, how do I solve it? So you can see like th there were many failed attempts. Like None of these get the distribution right. There's always empty spots. There's always like super tiny and super big circles next to each other. Ultimately, it got to a point where I had spent enough time that, or I guess it goes linear. Mm, where's, the, where's the mouse? Is there a mouse? Ah, yeah, there. So I think I'm going to skip through the video a little bit because this is getting boring. OK, so this was basically starting to populate a bit more intelligently in the beginning to, to, em to avoid empty areas. But what you see here is like a four minute video, but this is actually about four months of work. So, so what I mean to say is you, you will get to learn to code, but just don't give up. Like, it's going to be a very long journey. It's going to be like usually parametric tools or anything sophisticated. So th by this time, you can see like the distribution was starting to get really nice. I was starting to get continuous lines. And, 
and there were small circles and big circles and, and, and all sorts of things. But essentially, it ended up like this because we won the competition, and then the client wanted that facade, and, we, and, and then this thing had to come to fruition. Like, it had to become useful because suddenly we wanted to control all sorts of things. And then, and then I was like, OK, if I can control circles, maybe I can evolve it a little bit more. I can give it some kind of orientation and stuff. So I started doing that to ellipses. So this is all purely somebody who had just learned coding, satiating his curiosity by playing with things. And this was now, I was starting to use RGB images to, to tune eccentricity of circles to make them ellipses, and, and how could ellipses fight with each other with the similar logic and, and things like that. And this kind of went on for a while. So this became a full-fledged research where then I started using other kind of cellular algorithms like uh, Voronoi and Delaunay, Delaunay uh, to find homogeneous point distributions and, and try to just make nice patterns. That's kind of what was the ultimate agenda here, because nice patterns make nice buildings. So there, these were two corresponding algorithms, Voronoi and Delaunay. If you can relax one, you get the other for free, because they are uh, ma mathematically complementary to each other. So there were all these kind of things which were, which were starting to get interesting. And then I, I was like, OK, why don't I just do it on 3D? And that, that was, again, a few more steps of evolution. But this was the building, if you remember. And now I was starting to paint straight on top of the building and having circles to jump around on and climb facades of the building to, to start packing that. So that's kind of how that facade came into existence. This gave me a fair amount of confidence that hey, I can code. I can, I can solve problems. And I was like, OK, now I'm going to do research first. Just because I spent six months doing circle packing, I am going to do another six months of something that interests me. And then I'm going to find a project where I can use it. So essentially, because I could code, which means I had a hammer, every problem started to look like a nail. And so then I started doing a lot of, like, spending a lot of time reading research papers and revising high school maths and trying to remember how do these things and force fields and vectors and uh, matrices and rotations and quaternions and these kind of things worked. So I started producing some really pretty things. And at some point, it got so abstract that I didn't know how to use it in a building anymore. <laughs> so this, this was all just making, trying to make pretty patterns. So I would paint an image, and I would, I would get curves to follow the colors of that image and bend around if they, if they would encounter a change in, tone, in, in intonation or brightness or whatever. And, and this stuff was pretty tweakable. So essentially, instead of drawing all these curves manually, I would just paint a Photoshop image. And then to, to redraw this image would be super quick, because I would just change something in Photoshop. So I would take the same image, I would make it blurry, and suddenly it would generate a whole new pattern. But then again, remember, I'm, I'm at, an, at an architecture office, and none of this makes a building. So skipping through the boring part. So then I was starting to do it on 3D, which is basically simulating. This, this was quite common, actually, back in the day, uh, simulating how water would fall on a surface. So basically finding the lowest point where water would fall and like try to trace the trajectory of the nearest lowest curve. Then there was this kind of stuff. Actually, this, was, this became quite interesting, because this was almost like you would fill a space with three like in this case, three curves, but you could even do it with just one curve. You give it one curve, and, and the algorithm would populate the rest of the area with equal density curves, almost as if water was flowing through it. So this is called the stream. Uh, I even forgot what this algorithm is called. It's, I think it's called streamlines, or I'm not sure, actually. Um, but this became, I don't know how many of you are familiar with CNC milling, where you take a drill bit and it cuts out material. Because these are equally spaced, this became particularly good at being used as tool parts for CNC. So if you use this on foam or plywood or wood, you could suddenly sim artificially simulate textures of materials which did not exist. So, so this became pretty uh, handy for that. But again, it was like I made the algorithm first. I did not know that I would be able to solve a problem with it. I, I did it because I was like, hey, this is pretty. And then ultimately, these, <laughs> these algorithms found their way being force fit into landscapes, making landscape uh, projects or competitions for big projects. So this was purely an, algor an algorithm generating all of this, because we had a five-kilometer site, and we didn't know how to fill it in two days. 
So an algorithm did all the populating and made all these curves and trees. So you can see every, sing Oop, shit. every single tree was, every single tree here is completely different. And we asked the rendering company, of course, this was all populated by algorithms. And we asked the rendering company, can you make each tree, each tree different in color and size? And they came back and killed us. Like they, I mean, it was a Chinese rendering company, but still, like, like, I hope nobody uh, takes offense at that. But, but this was the second part of where that algorithm became useful. This, this was a workshop we did in Russia, of all places, uh, Sochi, and we did this kind of big, massive structure. Well, not really big. This, this whole structure was only 17 kilos in weight because it was made out of foam. The whole thing was built by this one guy on this one machine. And this, this was a homemade CNC machine. So you can see this is not even a drill bit. It's, it's an actual Dremel attached to an XY frame. But that's just how Russia operates. So <laughs> I mean, at least this workshop did. So those are three blocks of foam, which are essentially test samples. And what we did was we, we, we decided we we're going to build a structure. And we broke down the whole <coughs> structure into panels of a size that would fit on that CNC machine. And then we kind of generated these patterns. So you can see the same algorithm at work where there's two curves and the rest of the thing, the rest of the toolpath is calculated by the CNC machine. And then we went in and did further optimization that if this top left was the pattern that we actually wanted the CNC machine to do, and if you just simply gave the CNC machine that, it would do so many passes to, to lift up the tool, go to the other side, come down again. And that was taking an insane amount of time. And because we had like 50 panels to mill in one machine, we we're like, can we make this faster? So then we went. To, so then it took us half a day to figure out how to write an algorithm which would just basically make the tool, make the, make the machine a little bit more intelligent that it wouldn't have to cross over to the other side to to start a new curve. It, it could just trace that curve uh, in reverse, and it would save like I don't know, maybe six hours of time every day in milling. And when we did that, when we did the first test, this is foam. And if you sprayed it white or it, if you sprayed it brown, it would, it would start to look like wood. And that was purely a consequence of that algorithm working its way and, and us not using the, the CNC milling software. So all of these were foam blocks that were milled over three days by one man. Uh, and then we literally just glued them together. And it was, we, we had a structure with one man, one machine, and 17 kilos of foam. So this became quite, quite interesting. But again, it was all still very abstract and mathematical. And at some point, we were like, we are simulating all these things, like textures of wood or, or, or things like that. But what about real stuff? Like, what? A lot of times, we realized in Zaha, we spent a lot of time first inventing problems for ourselves and then solving them. So we would take two months to win a competition. In those two months, we would invent 2,000 problems. And then we would take two years and 2 million pounds to solve those 2,000 problems we created. So you're like, how about we, we make this process a little bit more intelligent in terms of like when we design, we don't design with these abstract mathematical rules of you know, space constraints or circle packing or, or I don't know, whatever, vector flows and stuff. But we actually look at how things are built, how machines build stuff, how material behaves, and try to like backward compute that into, into the design process. So, so obviously, folding paper is cheap and easy. And that's kind of where we started, or at least this was personally me, who, uh, like I started this in my spare time, which was literally folding paper and seeing if you can make, in Zaha, nobody makes a straight line. Everybody makes everything curved. And if you can make straight stuff do curved stuff, which means it's going to be easy to build, that you are, you have achieved something. So origami was kind of like a natural way of thinking about that, which was like, oh, origami is good at taking flat paper material, just folding it and building a curved surface out of it. But the good thing about this was, so this model took me about, I don't know, three hours to fold. But then writing this took, algorithm took maybe another three days. But once I wrote it, I could do 20,000 variations and look at the curve characteristics and structural characteristics and, re and repetitive qualities and stuff like that and in, in, an, in an indefinitely changing variety, which was just not possible if I was only making paper, paper folding models. So what I ended up, what we ended up doing was using these in a lot of workshops, um, and th this was again workshops that we did as a part of, like like the D Lab. We did a, we this was a result of an a, a visiting school we did uh, with the AA, uh, and this was kind of something that we were we were getting students to fold stuff, and somebody folded this, which was super interesting because 
you suddenly may see flat sheet materials start to do doubly curved surfaces. And, and doubly, being able to do doubly curved surfaces in architecture is like the holy grail, because everyone can do singly curved stuff. To do doubly curved stuff is what costs a lot of money, takes a lot of time, is super expensive, is hard to resolve, all of that stuff. But the simplicity of doing it in paper was so easy. This guy literally drew six curves, cut three of them, folded the other three, and he got this. And like, this is crazy. How can we? How can we do this in a more scalable way? How can you make buildings out of this? How can you like, design with this as an algorithm? So we started doing this kind of stuff, where essentially looking at one joint and understand, or, or looking at this one instance and trying to break down the principle of that and understanding that what that joint actually represents is a corner of, some, of a geometry like this, where you could literally take any geometry, put it through these steps, and you would get a, a, com a compounded shape like that. So if you combine many of those shapes that he built out of paper, you, you could get a skeletal wireframe like that. So then we kind of, we went balls out, we automated the whole thing. We're like, okay, we're gonna take the polygon, we're gonna planarize, uh, develop the curved surface, the folds, unroll it, lay it out on, on sheets, and then, and then see if we can build it. And again, the point of every workshop we tried to do was to build something just to see whether whatever we learned during that was real or not. And so when we built, when we were building it, we had to test if this is, if this has even the remote possibility of falling over someone. So this is actually testing the, the line spacing and the depth depth and the, and, and, and the sheet material thickness and all that kind of stuff works. And if we could nail that, we could go ahead and cut all the rest, bring everything to the workshop on the last day at 2 a.m., force everyone to not go home, <laughs> fold these things like crazy with screwdrivers. Look, there, there were, I think there were like 20,000 screws in this thing and you don't see a single power tool. This is how we do it. This is how we roll at the AA. <laughs> Screwdrivers and spanners. You can see the number of screws there, right? And basically, in one night, it was with about 30 students and six tutors, we managed to build this. We had some paper studies to do to figure out which were the two that we could afford to build. But the surface quality on this thing was amazing. Like, the screws, the, when they lined up, Everything sat so perfectly. Like you can see that there is a there is a joint here, but you can see that there is not a single dent. There is not a single problem in surface continuity. And this is really hard to achieve in architecture. I mean, like you know, we a bunch of like unskilled labor, and we were able to do this. So there was something in the technique or in the in the math underlying it that that made sure that this was happening. And we like we need to investigate this more. And as we did that, as we got better at doing this, we started getting better at even compounding these shapes. So this thing is actually built out of paper. And this is taller than people. This is about two meters tall. It's, a, it's about one millimeter thick cardboard. But the fact that cardboard could stand that weight and that they could compound so nicely, and this, this was, again, built in one day with students and superglue. And you can see th th this was a two-day workshop with undergrad students, and they, it, it takes almost no time. Like Everybody knows how to fold paper and glue it. So. Basically, the math was starting to get so powerful that it made the construction really simple. Before, we were inventing problems for ourselves in design. Now, we were solving problems for ourselves in design. So we, we were able to use code to simplify construction, to use completely unskilled labor, unsophisticated material, unsophisticated technique, paper, glue, and undergrad students. And you could build something <laughs> as complex or as elegant as this. I hope there are no undergrad students here. <laughs> <laughs> it was a late realization. I thought this was MTech. Um, so anyway, you, you can see the, the, the joints again, like the quality of joints and the alignment that we were able to achieve was, was I mean, pretty, pretty close to perfect. And this was kind of like, uh, I would say this was, uh, this was one project which was like a career highlight for me personally at Zaha, which was 
the beginning of my exposure to a whole new depth of research. So this this is a six, this is not a render. It's a six meter tall, six and a half meter tall, folded aluminum sculpture in Venice uh, that was kind of designed and built in from start to finish in about three months uh, by a team of like four people from Zaha, one structural engineer who was constantly having a heart attack, and maybe like four people on on the construction side. There used to be this company called Robofold. They don't, uh, unfortunately, don't exist anymore. But they used to use robots to fold metal. Uh, I'll just come to that. But this is all 1.5 millimeter thick aluminum. It was folded, and there is no other structure. It, it is self-supporting. So the folds are actually what gives it the, give it the strength. So the so okay, that's that's basically the team. That's the engineer. Uh, one single engineer on this entire project. Uh, four people from Zaha, and then there were uh, and in the. On the fabrication side, the whole thing was built by this company, Robofold, which I was just talking about. So again, it started from started life as a as a folded sculpture uh, out of paper, and then of course we are Zaha, so we will curve every single straight line we see, and and we did and we did, and then we tried to do it digitally, and it worked, and then we tried. There was still one straight line, and we were not happy with that. We were like, we we want to get rid of that, so we did, and then we built the same thing in aluminum as a mock-up. Uh, that did not go so well because whatever it had it had reasons to so this thing on the right those are those are robots at the back but they did not fold this they are only props in this photo this was all hand folded uh, this was basically the, the the there were problems here which meant this could not be scaled or sustain or, or sustainable or geometrically correct so we are like oh shit we need another line in there so we made another fold line in there and then this time before going to one to one mockups we bought sheet aluminum, which we could fold in the office, and we did. And that seemed to work out quite well. So you're like, OK, we nailed the process. That seems to work. And then we also did some mock-ups that worked. But now we had this big sculpture, which had 550 different panels, each one a different size, a different shape, and a different fold angle. These were supposed to be folded by robots. So the robots needed information about how to fold them. But before that, some other machine needed information about how to cut them. And you also needed to figure out how to join them. So there were algorithms developed for taking that each, taking each piece, rolling it flat on the ground, then then completely flattening it without distortion, then figuring out how they connect to each other. So then, so if you can connect them ring by ring, then you can assemble the whole panel as rings. Then you can figure out what the overlaps between them are. So literally, this is like folding an envelope and gluing the inside where you know where to put the glue. So this is the gluing panels, essentially, or the overlap panels. And then you have a set of front panels and back panels. And the back panels are the ones that will connect the front panels to each other. And once you can, once you can assemble that, then it was a matter of how do you dissipate that inform or, or what's the right word? How do you distill? No, decimate? No. Oh, whatever. Convey that information to the machines. Um, so this was, again, uh, generated algorithmically because there were 550 front panels and then an equal number of backing panels. Panels They were nested into sheets. So the black stuff here is the sheets, uh, the sheet size that, that Robofold had. This was designed to be exactly two Robofold specifications based on um, what CNC machine were they using. So there was a red layer for cutting. It's kind of like laser cutting. If you know laser cutting, there's a, score, there's a cutting layer, there's a scoring layer, there's a sheet layer. And then this was a different layer in this case because these were screw holes and this was for drilling. So the CNC machine would go and drill all the screw holes. So there were just four different layers. And every time the geometry changed, all of this CAD data could be produced nearly instantly. So what we gave Robofold was this big Rhino file and a Grasshopper file. So what the Rhino file did was give them every single sheet. And so there were, I don't know how many sheets in this. And they were sorted based on how the sculpture is going to be built. So ring by ring from the bottom to the top. So Robofold could just go, oh, I'm going to cut sheet number zero today. And they would put sheet number zero. And then for each panel, it would give you the fold states. So this was for the robot simulation. So the whole information end to end was basically text files and a drawing. So the text files were all robot folding information. And drawings were all of this. So the whole process, this was the f so this is why I call this a career highlight, because this was the first time we were able to automate down to you could change one CV in Maya to change the whole shape. And the, and the entire downstream process would recalculate within five minutes, and all the data would be 
regenerated for, for the robots to fall, for the CNC machine to cut. So this was, this was the dream of parametricism, so, so to speak. And this is how the robots are supposed to fold it. So they would take it, there was a static arm on the top, they would, the static arm would grab the middle face, and then the robots would fold the side faces. Uh, so this is how it was supposed to work. Uh, how it really worked was a lot of manual work. This is what the, the sculpture ultimately looked like, but it was hand, like 93% of the panels in there, maybe 90% of the panels in there were hand folded using A4 printouts like that to tell you what angle and then literally this kind of stuff. Uh, the, the problem was essentially that robots did not fulfill the promise that they were supposed to fulfill. So that was kind of like extremely frustrating for us because as somebody who was starting to really get to grips with automating the whole end-to-end -end, end -end thing of architecture, uh, like we could design something and we could completely produce all this CAD data or uh, construction data in instantly. What if you could also automate the construction of it using the robots themselves? Uh, was kind of the dream where we wanted to incrementally progress towards and I think a lot of architecture still is moving towards that goal. This is back in 2012. So I was personally curious that I, I, I was like, uh, the robots didn't seem to work. Maybe I want to try this on my own in my spare time. And once that starts to work, then I will start to use it in projects in the office or in the workshop. So what I ended up doing was out of a tinkerer's curiosity, I was like, I'm going to go and see if I can buy a, a robot for myself to play with. So this was the, the dilemma I faced. You can look at the two options, well, five options on this page. The most expensive option is $21,000 or $20,900, and the next available option is $400. So $400 to $21,000. $21,000 is obviously something an architect cannot buy, on an architect's salary at least. And $400, you, when you see that stuff on YouTube and what people do with it, it's, it's crap. Like, it's really bad. It doesn't even have six axes which is kind of the minimum you need for w working with architecture. So it was kind of like I was starting to have this false sense of confidence and pride that, you know, I can, I can solve problems. Maybe I can build my own robot. It's, it's just a bunch of motors and sticks. So this was the problem. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try doing that. So I, I had a workshop. In, I, I did a workshop with the AA in Dubai. And essentially this was... With students, uh, I, I worked on this on, in my spare time for about three months to build a robot from scratch. Uh, l literally out of that arrogance that it's just a bunch of... This is mute. Anyway, so this is a six-axis robot built by students in seven days. Uh, using laser cut plastic and a bunch of servos, and this is all programmed from Grasshopper. So I'd spent some three months doing that. So I was starting to get pretty confident that, hey, this robot seems to be getting somewhere. And you can see this was literally, we did it in the workshop. We laser cut the MDF. We hooked up the servos, glued it when it didn't work. It's the center. And there was a lot of math lessons. So when this rotates 300 degrees, this rotates on. And it's always, it's always better. Can you connect the motor from here all the way up to here? So I was a little bit impressed. This is not what we built. I was quite impressed that architects were able to, or were interested in like going completely geeking out with nuts and bolts and super glue and not like moving away from, from design and just going into this kind of semi-serious engineering for 10 days. But the, while we built no, nice toys at the end of it, I would say like these were fun to play with and they were fun for students to learn how to, how to think through maths and, and complexity. Basically, 
Okay. So, so we did a we had a lot of gimmicks like that, but again, you can, you can see it while it's it's a fun toy, it wasn't something that that was usable in any way architecturally. Of course, the students had a lot of fun playing with it. So anyway, moving on. I was starting to get serious with this. So this is literally in my bedroom, late night, two in the morning. I, I built the whole control panel in Grasshopper to start to control that robot and built a live interface between Rhino and Grasshopper uh, and the robot to be able to. So I was really starting to develop a full-fledged robot software inside Grasshopper in my spare time, just because I was really curious to push this and see where it, where it could go. But as you can see, so this, this was all live. I could change an angle in Grasshopper and the robot would re respond in real time. And then there was slightly more complex inverse kinematic stuff. Yeah, there. Where I could literally move a position in 3D space and the robot would follow that in real space. But by the motion quality, you can see it is still pretty crappy. So while it was promising that it's getting somewhere and while it was good for my confidence that this could be done and, and after, having, after learning mechanical engineering for almost one year in late nights and weekends, I was like, this, this robot is still quite crap. So the biggest problem was obviously laser cutting. I did not have a laser cutter at home and it was a, a real pain to, to find a laser cutter over the weekends and go and cut stuff. So I was like, I'm gonna go buy a 3D printer at some point. So anyway, coming to, so, I, I, and I was also starting to get frustrated. So I was like, in my, for me to develop this alone is gonna be pretty hard. Uh, so I open sourced everything. I basically put out all the drawings and all the code for it on, online. And I was like, let people develop it themselves and see if something, if collectively we can do something better. And, and then I was like, okay, this, this thing can like, I want to, at some point, I, I personally took the decision that I want to make this into something more serious than, than just a hobby project. And I think that was when I really started underestimating the magnitude of, of problems. So that's, that's where this line comes. Also the title of the lecture where I was like, I'm going to buy this printer, which I did buy. And then I, I have a, re a really good friend, Mustafa. He, he worked with me in Zaha for six years. He's also from the AA. Together, we, we both quit our jobs in Zaha, and we're like, we're going to dive into this and build a robotics company. And what, what's between us there is a 3D printed robot, which was kind of an evolution of the robot I built uh, in those workshops. Um, <clears throat> and this was all 3D printed, and it was starting to look like a product. And it was starting to get pretty complex in its assembly. It was six axis. It was starting to look really good. And we were starting to think of, of it as like this really portable robot the backpack. Okay, you could carry it around in a backpack, and it was literally like a gadget. You could plug it into your USB port, and it was up and running. It wasn't like a complicated industrial robot. I don't know if you guys saw. Have they seen the robots here? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So you know how complicated they are, uh, and how the installation and the health and safety and the number of stickers and the number of whatever else you need to do. So you're like, all of that is crap. You don't need that. We can make a simpler robot. That is where I would say was an underestimation of the problem. And what we also had going for us was our software became a lot more sophisticated. We, we, had, we had built this UI in, in Windows or in C++, in C++ where you could literally move the robot around and the software would observe you doing that and software, the software would just repeat it. So to do basic tasks, we made it really, really simple and straightforward. So you could, do, you could set up that little operation which it just did, picking a part and putting it in point B in literally like 30 seconds. And because the robots were quite lightweight, like here you can see it's literally just clamped to the desk. If I fast forward. Yeah, you can see here it's literally just clamped to the desk because they're quite lightweight. You didn't need to, like here, normally industrial robots would need a proper foundation and stuff like that. So as we were doing this, obviously nobody was paying us to do this. We had quit our jobs, which was paying, and now suddenly we were losing money. We were spending money building robots. We had no salary. We had no idea who's going to pay us to do this. We just knew that this was cool and we we're going to do this. So this is what Alex was talking about earlier, self-replicating robots. 
this is a hoax. The robot opens a 3D printer and goes in and takes out a part, which is basically, we, we just spun a nice story to it that the robot was doing it while we were not watching. So essentially, the robot's self-replicating. But trust me, this robot is completely stupid. <laughs> so anyway, what happened during that time while we were doing this and trying to figure out who's going to pay us to do this, we were also starting to become a little bit of, or not become, I would say start to develop a sense of what it takes to run a business and how, how, we, how at some point we need someone to start paying us money to do this. So we started looking at a lot of manufacturing because that's kind of where the robots are generally sold. And when you look at the state of manufacturing, this is the UK's largest t-shirt printing factory in central London. That person takes a t-shirt off that printer and puts it on the dryer every 15 seconds and she does that eight hours a day. And this man takes a blank t-shirt and loads it onto the printing machine every 15 seconds, eight hours a day. So this is, this is the UK. This is not some low, low, low income, uh, low labor income economy somewhere in the abyss. It is very much here. And you, and you see that everywhere. And suddenly we, were, we, we spent a good four or five months just doing factory visit after factory visit after factory visit, looking at what people do with robots and what people don't do with robots. So just looking at, like, this, some of these people were trained electricians and welders and whatever, like, they were skilled people, but they were doing, they were working like robots. And the reason for that was, and we were like, we always thought, like, hey, you know what, architects need robots because architects want to play around with it. But then when you look at these people, they, their requirements for these things are a lot, this video is kind of useless their requirements for robots are a lot more serious. And when you understand the whole problem, it's like it's not just the robot that's expensive, the software, which is, it costs you another few thousand pounds or dollars. And then the installation is the killer part. And the reason why the installation is so expensive, I will just come to that. The, the ultimate result of that is that even in manufacturing, 93% of tasks, this is a statistic that we didn't find, we didn't develop. This is from research reports, market reports. When they say automatable tasks, it means technology for automating these things already exists, but they're just not automated. And the reason for that is just because it's, it, the installation process of robots is extremely complicated. So we're like, hey, we were not the only ones having this problem. A lot of manufacturing also has these problems. So anyway, ultimately, as we, as we were kind of building a company, we started learning about all of these other things, and, and we started talking in that language. And, finding these ways of how we could fund ourselves and how we could pay our salaries. We, we became decently good at it. And now we are, we are as uh, Alex was saying, we are a 12-people company. Uh, you, I don't know if you guys know ABB. You probably have KUKA robots here. But ABB is another robotics company. They also invested in us because they thought, they, they thought this, this had some potential. So this is kind of what our robots look like now. We developed our entire software to, become, to be on, in the browser. Like, we don't develop, uh, like, I, at least the two of us don't do any of this work anymore. That's what the robot does, looks like. It's a six-axis robot that can do moving operations and things like that quite easily. The software is wireless. It runs in a browser or your phone or your tablet or a computer. And it's starting to get to a point where the performance is decently industrial scale, and it's accurate enough that it can pick up parts on those little two millimeter pins and drop them accurately. So, so coming from a company of two architects, we've kind of, we are now doing stuff like this where it's completely about robots and software and hardware. And I keep thinking, if I, if three years ago, I knew how long it would take, I would have never done it. I would have never started that company. I would have never ever even thought of building robots. Uh, but now that I, I have, I don't regret it. But just thinking back, and it, like as, as kind of like a moral of the story for myself and for anyone else who would be interested, like if you know the complexity of the problem, you will probably never solve it. So a little bit of naivety often helps because you, it takes you far enough and then you're like, oh shit, now I'm in the middle of it, and I either can go across or I have to swim back. And then you, you don't have a choice because you'll sink. So that's why you jump in on the deep end and you start swimming. 
And having learned or having studied uh, architecture a long time ago and then having worked as an architect for 10 years and having worked in Zaha, which is kind of the epitome of where an architecture career can go, I would say the one lesson that I at least personally took away from that was to not get married, well, at least for me, it was not that important to be married to a profession. Uh, that it, it was a hard decision to, to kind of move away from architecture, but the, the biggest takeaway was that I, I learned how to learn and not what to learn. And because what you learn today will be outdated tomorrow for sure in whatever profession you are. So you learn grasshopper today, something else will come tomorrow. Whoever learned monkey six years ago was pretty outdated when grasshopper came along. So tools will change. So, so for me, the biggest thing was, or, or the best takeaway from architecture itself has been that it's so diverse and it's so outward looking that it tells you or teaches you how to, how to look at other things and admire them and appreciate them, but also learn from them. And applying that skill to nearly any problem I can I can see that it's quite a scalable skill to have. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Sugar. I would like to ask if there are any questions from our audience. And anyone wondering how he overcame certain details he likes? Very elegantly, he escaped. <laughs> well, I have to say that it's um, very insightful on, you know, on certain matters that also we have to deal here ourselves. And I hope this was taken into account by, by our students, um, especially the fact that uh, you know, you look at the tool, for instance, and you immediately think this is the solution, the panacea for everything. You can apply it to everything, and eventually you realize that maybe that time, that moment in time, there's going to be evolution about that tool, there's going to be evolution of the problem itself, so you better have yourself an evolutionary, let's say, uh, character. And I think that last bit that you said is uh, one of the most critical things for anyone who is even doing that jump from one profession after so many years and that level of expertise to another, let's say, uh, interesting profession. But, um, I mean, I, I have to say that becoming so, let's say, technical at the same time can drive you away from any sort of design aspect, but it seems that you have, you have a good balance. And I wonder, when you, you know, when you want to become even more industrial, are you thinking you're going to keep that kind of like sensibility about it, or when it comes to interfacing, maybe? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. It's actually like, so like if, if I go back to this, like this is kind of like the, the whole thing is taken from Maya, for instance. Like this is a, the, the, this is keyframing software. And, and that's, you, if you know, it, like robot software does not work like that. And, so although we don't directly write any code anymore or, or take direct design decisions, well, we do to some extent take design decisions now still. But there is a lot of designer background thinking. So I, I'm not saying it consciously affects us, but in subconscious ways, it constantly creeps into our decision making where you cannot tolerate ugly. You cannot tolerate complex. And when somebody does that, like. This is still ugly, I would say. Like, and and the first thing we did, or or very recently, we we did hire um, kind of like a graphic designer to come and tweak these things, just because, from an engineer's like now we we are the only two designers in the company. Everybody else is an engineer, which was a really hard hiring process to go through. How do you hire an engineer, especially when you've never worked with one and you don't know what a good engineer looks like? So now that everyone is an engineer, we are the only two people in the company holding this flag, fl uh, this flagpole that this is design or this is still this still has to be user friendly. When every engineer is making the technical argument that no, this is the the technical debt of that or the cost of that is too high and blah blah. blah. But I think at when, when now when we show this to people who want to who are interested in using these robots, they can they can see the value of why that simplicity exists. And 
and, and a big part of not, not wanting to do this was engineers for engineers. So I think like the rest of the team is starting to see that now, but it, 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 it has taken some fighting. But to be honest, I think we are also getting subdued. So we have to consciously make an effort to not be, turn into engineers. Hi. Hi. Uh, I would like to thank you at first because it's a really inspiring talk, and um, I want to ask you, like, how did you, like, how did you think that the robot would be the most, um, the element that would have most potential for you to evolve or like to develop? Why was it the robot and not, not something else, something more digital, maybe, like the any software, for example? I have asked myself that question a lot of times. <laughs> Uh, because it would have been so much easier if we if we took the robot out and just had the software, you could have like things could have moved a lot faster. The robot makes everything more complicated. Um, and when when it, when things were still at this stage, there was a robot to it and there was a software to it. And the software element, there, there were other. Um, let's say my interest was not even at this stage. My interest was not in building the robot. My interest was in using the robot to do something more meaningful in architecture, to be able to design stuff, or to be able to just hack around with stuff uh, and see what, what, it can, what it can do. I, don't, I didn't exactly have a use case in mind. But the application was more important. I didn't want to become a software developer, per se. I could write a lot of code, but I didn't want, I didn't see myself um, like it, it was just a career trajectory that did not excite me. I wanted to build stuff. That I was good at that, and I liked that, and I, there, there is some craft to it, and I, I used to like that. Any other questions? That's what happens when you have a super clear lecture. <laughs> yeah, hi. Um, so I would like to ask a question about different processes. So basically, what are you? Uh, explaining uh, on the factories, um, you say that the robots, they can actually replicate what people are doing now. But what if robots can do something which, like uh, the technique which people can't do at all, like sintering now, like extrusion and so on. Do you think that this human labor replacement is more, I don't know, more useful now? Or uh, should we invent something completely different? Because, like, yeah, people are doing it with the hand, and then you're creating the robot which has the gripper and taking it. But yeah. maybe there is something else there. I, I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I think there will be both. Uh, you will be using... The, so it's not just a question for robots. That's a question that applies to technology in general, I would say, where do you use technology to replace what people do, or do you use technology to do things that people cannot do? So if you look at um, autocomplete software, which is on every keyboard in the world now, it's basically augmenting you. It's, it's not replacing you. But at some point, auto responses are going to get smarter. Like email auto responses are already starting to get smarter. So machine translation is the same. At some point, like initially, machine translation was augmenting people. And now translation is becoming so good that you don't even need people in translation. Yes, translation was a job. It was an industry that is dying. Uh, it's the same with customer service, where now Facebook chatbots are starting to take over customer service. And you, you will soon be able to have entirely meaningful conversation with, 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 or not meaningful conversations, but at least have your issues resolved with customer service entirely with bots. So in robots, I would say, Yes, there are, uh, like, especially if you look at the automotive industry, robots do welding, they do heavy lifting, they do stuff that people just cannot do. But if you look at electronics manufacturing, for instance, which is smaller stuff, like somebody who's making iPhones or tablets or laptops, where you don't need to lift a lot of weight, you don't need to do a lot of welding, but you just need to operate really fast. You, you cannot, and, and you need to be pretty flawless. People cannot operate fast and think fast at the same time at least in these kind of things. Or if they make an error, the cost of that is very high. So in those cases, yes, the robots are replacing people. Because other, if your only other option was to use people and to run your production line slower, right? So it's the same with, like, 
I would say printing is something, 3D printing or sintering is something that could not have been possible if you didn't have robots. Uh, but in a lot of cases, a simple bricklaying robot would still be able to be, I don't know if it, if it already is, but it's easy to imagine that bricklaying robots will at some point become faster than human beings at bricklaying. But does that mean we should not use them and we should only use technology for things that people cannot do? I don't know if there's, a, if, there's a one, if there's only one way. Technology will basically infiltrate everything that it can. And people will use it because it will be cheaper and faster. This is a simple question. When, 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 when is it going to be available to order? <laughs> when is it out? <laughs> uh, depends on how reliable you want it to be. Um, we, are, we are already shipping betas. for. Uh, we're doing some trials with people. But we don't have a, a lot of... We are building about three to four robots a month right now. Uh, we will slowly ramp up later this year and early next year. But uh, right now, it's still, I would say, betas. So these are still baby steps. Uh, not, not suitable for CNC milling or 3D printing yet. Or hot wire cutting, especially, because it's plastic. <laughs> it might cut itself. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want to end up with a suicidal robot. <laughs> if there are no other questions, yeah, thank you very much. It was great.